Just one second, I'll attach the camera. How many minutes do we have before we start? Uh, about five minutes, sir. Okay. Uh, can I just request everybody to keep themselves on mute during the speak, uh, talk so that there is no background noise? Hello. Hello. I think we can start now. Okay. Yeah. Musket, are you there? Uh, yeah, I, I, you're muted, but thank you for coming. Thank you for joining. Thank you for lecturing. So good evening, everybody. I say evening because I'm in New Delhi, India, and it's 5.30 in the evening here. And to those of you who are in Europe, Good morning. Thank you all for joining. I'll say a few words and then hand over the mic, so to speak, to Masket, who is going to speak. This is from the Human Rights Law Network. And to those of you who are outside India, particularly for those, I would say, it's, it is a pretty extensive organization of lawyers and legal activists with about 150 full-time lawyers and legal activists and a large penumbra of sympathizers and friends and fellow lawyers, fellow human rights activists who help when they are called upon to help. And we do pro bono legal work, work for the poor. But it's not just legal aid. The Human Rights Law Network and its lawyers are active participants in the struggle for the emancipation and liberation of the working class and the poor in this country. We have developed a certain expertise in public interest litigation, which in India is a constitutional law remedy of a class action nature, where very quickly and very cheaply, we are able to do class action petitions on behalf of large sections of people and get reasonable results without spending too much money. And the leading case, as far as the Human Rights Law Network is concerned, is the right to food case, which brought reliefs and this sounds 
a little bit unbelievable to about 400 million people through court orders that went through a decade of litigation. Now, apart from public interest litigation, we also do trainings and so on. This lecture series is the beginning of the Center for Constitutional Rights, where we separate the organization into two parts, the Human Rights Law Network doing litigation and the Center for Constitutional Rights doing trainings, particularly for lawyers and activists in the global south. Public interest litigation, I think India is perhaps the leading country, but there are many jurisdictions in Latin America, Africa, and Asia, where young lawyers are doing spectacular work in public interest litigation. And the purpose of setting up the Center for Constitutional Rights is to concentrate all that work, all those judgments, and develop and advance public interest litigation, particularly in the global south. And the second component of our training is to bring international law, international judgments, to bring them to lawyers in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Speaking particularly for Asia, our young lawyers have little access to international law training. We have very few contacts with lawyers outside India, with developments of law outside India. And that is why we have the lecture series, which we start today with Muscat. And we are very grateful, Muscat, that you agreed to speak at such short notice. The, uh, I'm pleased, very pleased to introduce you to Muscat Bendel. She is from an organization called the Association for Civil Rights in Israel. She was a staff attorney for many years, focusing on human rights in the occupied territories in Palestine. She served as the director of projects in the occupied territories for Physicians for Human Rights, Israel. She will tell you what she's going to speak of, and she will give you any more background details of the case that she's going to speak of. And the format for the lectures is going to be a prominent judgment from a country introduced by a person having intricate knowledge of that, of that judgment. And she will speak of the judgment, the background law, the principles of law that could be culled out and so on. We are happy to have with us quite a large number of participants in today's talk. So thank you everybody for joining and Masket, thank you for coming once again and you have the floor. You have the waves, so to speak. Yes, hi everyone. Uh, first, I would like to say that I'm really, really excited about uh, talking here in front of you. And uh, I think it's amazing that we can sit in the two sides of the globe and, you know, share our experience and passion and obligation to promote and protect human rights. And even though the circumstances, I assume, are very different in each country, um, I would like to tell you about the experience that we have here in Israel. And maybe if we can learn from one another and share our knowledge, uh, that everyone will benefit. So uh, I will start by saying a few words about uh, a Association for Civil Rights in Israel, the Association for Civil Rights, ACRI as we call it. Uh, this is uh, the largest and oldest human rights organization in Israel. And when I say largest, I understand that there are about 150 lawyers here. We are about 15 lawyers maximum. And still we are the largest because Israel is a very, very small country, about 9 million people, all in all. Uh, but uh, the uniqueness of ACRI is, is that um, we uh, deal with a large array or variety of human rights violations, starting from civil rights, 
social rights, minorities' rights, um, rights of uh, Palestinians in the occupied territories, uh, gender rights, uh, prisoners' rights, uh, uh, almost everything. So we have a very uh, a large knowledge about uh, human rights issues in Israel. And the main tool that we're using is the legal tool. I am an attorney. Uh, we also have an education department, department and we do a lot of public work, um, but we use mostly uh, the tool of uh, um, um, promoting legislation, litigation in different courts, and of course, policy change and public, uh, um, public work to change uh, conceptions regarding human rights in Israel. Uh, though the scope of issues in Israel, I assume, is much smaller than what's going on in India, for instance, or other countries, um, I think that we share the basic uh, challenges regarding uh, human rights, especially of uh, minorities, marginalized people, and poor people, because we have everything here in Israel. Uh, a few words about myself. Uh, as... Uh, as was said, I started as a volunteer for Physicians for Human Rights, and I did a variety of positions there. I had a variety of positions. I went to study the law just, you know, to try to see if I'm interested. I, my first degree is in textile design, and um, I found uh, it fascinating. And I be, went to be an intern in, for ACRI, and I stayed there. I'm there for over 10 years now. Uh, and I did a lot of, uh, um, I, I, I covered a lot of fields in ACRI, starting from uh, occupied territories, uh, human rights in the occupied territories, privatization and human rights. And now I'm focus, focusing on poverty and uh, child protection processes in the welfare uh, system. Uh, and I'm doing that for almost seven years. And I will start to, I will speak today about two cases in which I was involved and one which is still ongoing. Uh, one of them is focusing on the right to running water and the other is on the right to electricity. Um, but I want to put it into context. Why did we start focusing on these issues? Uh, um, and while you might say that the, uh, the target uh, or the goal is much wider. Actually, uh, a few words about uh, the, the, the legal uh, system in Israel. So we inherited the legal system from the British uh, and uh, the, 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 the system, the structure and the hierarchy pretty much remained the same as it was when the British, uh, when the British mandate was, uh, uh, was here. And uh, we have like uh, district, local courts, district courts, and then the Supreme Court of Justice, only one in Israel. And we have several courts which speci specify on family law, uh, work law, uh, labor, sorry, uh, and some social rights. Uh, but the main court which we address is the Supreme Court of Justice in Israel. We don't have a constitution. Uh, we probably will never have a constitution because of the political situation. Um, but we do have some constitutional laws, uh, which we call basic law, uh, who have a um, status of constitutional law. We have a few of them. They're not very elaborate, but in most of the work uh, uh, with this legislation is done by um, actually, sorry, I will close the window by uh, the way that the court interprets those laws. Uh, the main law is called the right to human dignity. Uh, it has two parts. One of them is uh, a, a list of rights, which is very, very minor, like uh, the right to freedom or the right to, um, to go in and out of the country or the right to human dignity, which is, what is it actually? And then the second right, the second part of this legislation is a series of uh, conditions in which you have to examine or scrutinize every legislation and see whether it is in the standard of this constitutional law or is it harming to human rights, etc. During the years, the Supreme Court of Justice interpreted that law and inserted in it almost every right, every right. 
But the problem is, is because it is by interpretation, then there is a lot of debate all the time regarding the status of these rights, because the state of Israel and its parliament actually did not write these legislations. They were done by the Supreme Court of Justice. And because of the political situation, it is under uh, a lot of criticism all the time. From one side, it is said that it's a very activist court and it does what it's not supposed to do. And uh, it takes the politicians and they, they elect the people elected. Uh, uh, and it, and it, it actually creates, uh, it takes over the country. Uh, on the other hand, from human rights perspective, it's not doing enough to protect the most vulnerable populations in Israel because of the very, very, um, I would say, delicate situation in which this court is, is, um, is acting in. Um, so what we have is a few legislation, is, is, is a legislation which is not harmonious, some are missing. We don't have all human rights uh, uh, actually acknowledged uh, by the court. And what we do as human rights organization is, you know, taking our cases to the court. So we have a ruling that acknowledges some of the obligation of the state. And by nature, it's it's very it's very targeted. It's very small. It's not. It doesn't encompass all the problems regarding uh, certain population or issues. So whether the court, the Supreme Court of Justice is the defender of the poor and marginalized in Israel, it's a big question. Many people will say, no, it's not. No, it's not because uh, different uh, structural reasons, among them is the composition of the court. Who are those judges? They are people from a very certain background uh, what do they know about poverty? What do they understand about people living in poverty? Did they ever feel what it means like to be poor? Uh, mostly the question to that is no, they don't. They just don't. So when we go to court, we have to, to make it, to make them feel and understand and identify with the experience of people living in poverty. And this is a huge, uh, it's a huge challenge because we're dealing with people who don't really understand it from their experience. Uh, I have to say something in brackets now that uh, our court really is looking, mostly late in, in the latest year, it's less and less, but uh, during the last two decades, uh, there is a lot of interest of what's going on in other constitutional forums in the world, including the one in India. Uh, they do cite a lot from uh, the decisions of uh, Supreme Courts in India, and uh, we also used it in our uh, appeal regarding electricity. I will say a few words about it. Um, so there is a lot of importance, first of all, for these judgments, and then for the for uh, enabling uh, legal bodies, organization, and judges around the world to, 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 to know about these judgments. And I think it's very important what we're doing here today is starting to share our knowledge uh, regarding what's going on in different parts of the world, maybe regarding the same issues. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about the right to adequate standard or living of living or uh, existence in human, uh, uh, in, in human dignity, uh, it has a few words. But in Israel, it is derived from the right to human dignity in that constitutional law, which is like the, the, the source for almost all the social rights. And um, what we are trying to do for uh, a more than a decade now, even almost two decades now, is to try and make the state of Israel not only define what it means to live in human dignity, but also to have a formula so we can know how much this existence in human dignity is in dollars, in shekels, in, in whatever coin you want, you know, to make it specific and to have a formula in which you have not only the components, but also what does it mean in practice. So uh, this is the goal. We are doing what we're doing. My position now is actually to make sure that the state of Israel uh, will not only commit, but also will act uh, to, uh, to, to make 
the right to a uh, dignified existence accessible to every person living in Israeli, not only Israeli, every person living in Israeli, um, in Israel, and we have refugees, we have Palestinians, uh, we have a lot of people here which are not, which are not citizens, uh, so we started by going about uh, like it was 2003, we went to court with a lot, a lot of other organizations and uh, the background was that there were huge cuts in uh, social security allowances that were completely arbitrary and uh, we went to the Supreme Court of Justice and what we said for the state of Israel should prove why is what is left for these people enough. How is it enough for uh, existence in human dignity? And uh, it took a few years, but unfortunately, we lost that case. I think the state of Israel lost this, this case, the citizens of Israel. And uh, we have a very nice verdict. It's beautiful. It's very elaborate. It's talking about the right to human existence and dignity and how important it is. But it really says nothing. It really says nothing. And this was such a deterrent for us and for other human rights that it took us almost 10 years to start rethinking what can we do about the situation of poverty in Israel, which increases all the time. If I have time, I will speak a little bit about what's going on now during the, the Corona time, uh, but I'm not sure I will have enough time. So I want to say a little bit about something about the social network here in Israel. We have a social security uh, network, we have allowances which provide basic, uh, basic income during time of need, uh, like uh, illness, like unemployment, like uh, some kind of disability, uh, but it's very, very little. And as I said, it is completely arbitrary. You just don't know how it was decided that it's going to be X dollars, for instance, and it's not enough. Those people are living in terrible poverty. We have a general um, uh, health, insur health insurance system, which actually is uh, a very good one, considered to be a very good one around the world. We pay taxes, which include some uh, tax for the health, in health insurance and for the social security insurance. But we have a good health system, which is accessible to every person who has health insurance. It does not include refugees, it does not include Palestinians, it includes citizens or residents who live in Israel. Uh, we also have a public education system, which is supposed to be free of charge, but not really free of charge. We pay a lot of money for that. Uh, but it's there, it's, it's accessible for most people. And we have public housing, uh, which is not enough, not sufficient. It does not provide an answer to most people in need. But it is more than nothing. I mean, you have some support from the state if you cannot afford to rent an apartment. So, as I said, there is no right to live in human dignity. Uh, there is no written right. It is uh, done by the court's decision and ruling and in a way of interpretation of the rights that are already there. Um, what we have decided during the last few years is not to go straight forward to court and say, okay, now you have to acknowledge this right and say what it means. We are trying to bypass it. We are taking different cases to different courts and we're trying to, to attack the issue of their non-formula by different means. For example, we went to a, a court which is specifies on labor and social security and uh, we attacked a regulation that forbids people on allowances from getting help from their relatives. If I am on allowance and I, somebody is paying my rent, my, my family, for instance, because I can't afford it, I lose my allowance and I have to, to, to pay back to the state. So we went, we went to court and we attacked this regulation and we won. And uh, what it means is, first of all, that there is an acknowledgement that... Uh, um, that, you could, that this, this allowance is not enough for living. And because it's not enough, you cannot uh, forbid a person from uh, getting help from someone else. Um, what else did we do? We did try to go and say, okay, if the state doesn't give what it needs to give, it shouldn't take, it shouldn't allow other people to take. So we are focusing for the last few years 
on the issue of debts, people indebted, poor people who owe money to different authorities or even to semi-private uh, um, um, suppliers. And uh, there was a lot of change for the good during the last few years. For instance, um, a few years ago, if you didn't pay your debts, you could be imprisoned. Today, it is not allowed. This is also something that ACRI was involved for many years in the struggle to ban uh, imprisonment of people indebted, which cannot just cannot pay their debts. And um, we have some protection on wages. For instance, if I owe someone money and he is trying to uh, seize my wage um, to have a seizure order or something, then he cannot seize everything. He needs to leave me the basic amount for living, which is calculated as the basic allowance that the state gives. Um, but the major problem that we saw is that uh, when people were indebted to uh, suppliers like the electricity company or the water companies, corporates, then if they didn't pay, they were just cut off water and electricity. Now, I have to say a few words about the, the, the system of electricity and water in Israel. Um, the system of electricity and water were both uh, provided by the state during the previous, like, uh, I think, say almost 60 years in which the state exists, sometimes through local authorities, but sometimes directly uh, through governmental companies. And during the last decade or even more, we see a huge wave of privatization, many services that were semi-privatized or privatized to different suppliers. And what the state did is that uh, the whole um, issue, or the whole part of supplying an infrastructure went to these companies, is under their, uh, uh, um, they are, they're supposed to, to, to provide that for the state and for the citizens. And the state withdrew actually to regulation and supervision. So we have two supervisory uh, authorities. One is the water authority and the other the electricity authority. But they see themselves as regulators. They determine the prices. Uh, they don't see themselves as defenders of accessibility to these services. So what we did during the last, uh, I think it was like almost, almost um, eight years or even more, nine years, we are keep saying to the state, even though you privatize the supplying of these services, you are in charge and part of the right to living in human dignity is to have running water and electricity. Not, you know, like carte blanche to, 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 to consume without any kind of limitation, but you have to say what is the basic amount of water and the basic amount of electricity that every person needs to survive in human dignity. Um, I wanna say something, I will tell you a little bit about both struggles, but I wanna say something which is like, um, what actually is uh, relevant to those two fields which we dealt with. So it was in both ways, in both, in both cases, a very long struggle. It's a marathon. We, it's never ending. Even though water is so-called behind us, we still have little uh, legal uh, cases in which we have to deal with cutting water from different reasons to different populations. Uh, in both of them, the connection to the ground to understand the problems on the ground was crucial. It was crucial to the promotion and partially the success of these struggles. Uh, and it was crucial not only for, uh, you know, presenting the problem and legislating. It was crucial for us to articulate and understand the issues on the ground. And I think it's also very, very important to make the solution, the legal solution, not only feasible and doable, something which is for the long run and will not change because it's come, it grows from, from the grassroots. Okay, so I will start talking a little bit about the issue of water. <coughs> um, um, just in, in general, we started working on the issue of water on 2009, just writing a very simple letter to the parliament uh, committee, which is called the Knesset in Israel. Uh, I think even back then we didn't understand the scope of the problem. We didn't have the right terminology 
to, uh, you know, to, to say this is a human right. This is not a consumer supplier issue. So it, will, it was also for us a learning experience. We learned from that experience. So in very short, water was supplied by the state for, many, for almost all, all, those, all the last uh, 60 years in which the state of Israel is relatively young. We are uh, 70 something years old. And uh, it is still that the basic sources of water are still owned by the state. So we have a, a state authority, which is called Mekorot or sources in English. And they sell the water to the different uh, suppliers of water. And they actually, actually the state is uh, determining the tariff, the, the price of the water and the regulation of how it will be provided, what happens when somebody doesn't pay for it, etc. So there was a huge uh, process of uh, privatization in the field of water, and, but it's, a go, it's going back and forth. For instance, it was first it was, uh, uh, the case wanted to get rid of it. They'll just have like a water corporates, they will supply the water. We don't wanna deal with it, we're just regulating. But today they are talking about national, nationalizing these systems because it doesn't work that well the way they thought it would. And it costs a lot of money to the state as well. So um, what uh, I wanna tell you about how we started and what I said about uh, the Supreme Court of Justice, uh, that the composition is in, in, a, in a large, uh, in a way it's also true to us, the lawyers in Acre, uh, most of us, I mean, most of us come from like, um, uh, you know, um, we're not uh, the most affluent people in Israel, but we're like, we could say we're middle class, we're educated, we have, most of us own our houses, we have water, we pay our bills. Uh, most of the people doesn't really understand what poverty is. So the first step in this uh, struggle was to go to the people who experience these difficulties regarding running water and hear what they have to say about it. And in the, 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 the beginning, they didn't even know to articulate or to say this is a human rights issue. They just say what's difficult for them. And this is something that you see a lot in the beginning. You search, you search for the right terminology. It's not immediately that you say, wow, this is a, right, a human right and the state has to give it, uh, it takes time. So we have to uh, help them and help ourselves make the demand from the state more accurate and more feasible and uh, to, uh, to start speaking about it in human rights uh, terminology. But we're also, you know, we're also a part of this concept which we live in. For instance, you have to pay your debts or water cost money. What if for, the beginning, we start saying, what would it be like in a perfect world? In a perfect world, you don't have to pay for money or for electricity because this is basic. It doesn't mean that we demand that it will be given for free, but this is the start of losing our conceptions and starting opening our minds to new conceptions. Um, and I think it's also our position to, to go to the authorities and not only to show them the problem, but also to talk about it in human rights terminology and not just as a commercial or consumerism issue. So uh, when we started working about it, it was not an issue. Nobody thought that there is a problem with people being disconnected from water. This was something that was in, uh, done to other people, not us. Uh, we didn't know how many people we maybe blame them for not being responsible enough, not paying their bills, not being able to support themselves. But when you start looking and seeing that this is a nationwide problem and you start seeing the construction and the system that creates, first of all, poverty, and then makes people stay in poverty, their children stay poor, and what the state gives or does not give to these people to help them, to give them tools, then you start seeing, you start having a conception of social, social justice. And I think that this is what is for, for Acre, it was a, it was, it was a, it was a long um, march, I would say, because we started as an organization focusing on civil rights. 
And uh, because of the composition of the people working for Acre, because of their interests in civil rights, in freedom of ex expression, and uh, this kind of issues. <coughs> so what happened is that once we had our partners on the field, which were mainly social workers, and the people living in poverty themselves, we went to the Knesset and we started speaking to the people making the decisions in the, in the Knesset and the policy makers. And in the beginning, they looked at us as if, what, what are you talking about? It's not an issue. It's not a problem. It's not our uh, obligation. If people, doesn't, if people don't pay, it's their problem. So you start, start tackling these, these objections one by one. And uh, the main challenge was to, uh, to address the issue of finance. Who will pay for the water if they don't pay and they still get water? They will just get like free water without any kind of limitation. So mostly the minister, Ministry of Finance is the main objector to everything that has to do with social rights because social rights cost money. So we had to show them that it's for the benefit of the state. And it's a financial interest to make sure that people don't stay without water. And it doesn't mean you give, you give, you, you, you don't collect the debt or you don't go to, you know, to collect the debt in legal ways, but there is, you have to, to separate uh, the obligation to uh, allow access to this very ba basic, basic mean of existence and the debt you need to collect the debt, you have legal system that can do it and do it, but you have to separate the two. And this is a conceptual idea that was completely new in Israel because you know you don't pay, you don't get, you don't pay for electricity, you're being disconnected. In the beginning, people tell us what if somebody goes to the grocery shop and he, he buys, uh, he takes bread and he doesn't pay for it, what do you expect for the grocer just to keep giving him the bread? So you have to tackle these um objections one by one and i think that if you talk about strategy what we decided very early on during this struggle is that we are not in front we are not in the front we are giving the stage to the people who live in poverty they know best what's the issues what's the problems what is their experience in life and what are the solutions they know best and we are staying in the background as legal advisors or as attorneys but we are giving them central stage and it was amazing all of the knesset meetings and all of the court sessions these people were in the front and they spoke in their own language which is not always like we would speak but it was very very efficient and uh, what happened is that we found in the parliament many people that were became our partners. And in a way, the water case, we had a lot of luck because we managed to convince the head of the economic commission that was in charge of water that something has to be changed. In the meanwhile, in the, mean, in the middle of everything, we went to court and we went to the Supreme Court of Justice with an administrative claim. We said, you have regulations. What do you do when somebody doesn't pay? But it's not enough. It doesn't have enough uh, protection on due process uh, and every kind of uh, hearing that you need to give before you, uh, before you don't allow access to basic um, services. So there was no judgment on this case because in the meanwhile, the state an announced at court that they're going to have regulation and the regulations will be substantial. So we withdrew the case and went back to the Knesset. And of course, during that time, we had a lot of public work. The public work was amazing and it was a huge part of this, uh, this campaign. Uh, because when you uh, show to the general public, when you let them identify with the experience of what it means to be without water, everybody identifies. What does it mean to be a mother that cannot wash her baby? To be a person with a disability that cannot wash? How do, do these people live? They go to the public garden and they wash in the, you know, in the tap water? Or they steal water from their neighbor? Is that what we want to see in our country? 
So the, we had a lot of work with journalists and this is always a very, very huge part of our work and, and, and a very important component. So to make a long story short, what happened is a miracle. Um, the Minister of Finance, which was like the main objector to everything that we wanted, decided uh, that he's, he's going to give it a try. And today we have a set of regulation which is very progressive. And what it says is that you cannot cut off water people who cannot pay their bills. Who decides? This is also something that we always uh, address. It is sort of administrative, but not only also a constitutional claim. It's not for the, the supplier to decide. This is a private body and he is in a conflict of interest. Only a state or somebody by the state can, des can decide if a person have enough means to pay his bills or not. So they have a special committee in which you have to address, not us, the supplier needs to address and say, this person has money, is just lying and I want to disconnect him. And this committee decides. And I have to say that until today, there was zero, zero appeals to this committee. Uh, so this, the situation today in Israel is that you, if you don't pay for your water, you're not, you're not getting disconnected. It didn't end there. We had another stage in which you had to implement it all over Israel because you had different suppliers. Uh, we had a case of uh, one, uh, one city that uh, disconnected all um, houses of uh, asylum seekers from electricity and from water. Uh, and uh, the, the target was just, you know, to deport them from the city because they didn't want to, ha to have them there. So we are still going to courts on very small cases, but the basic principle is there. Water is a basic service which is needed to, uh, um, to address or to fulfill the human right to living in dignity or the human right to dignity. And I think we are very proud of that. We are, I, I, I really, I think it's not only our work but as I said, it was a combination of partners which we found in the parliament and a lot of luck, to be honest. Um, yeah. uh, I wanna say a few words about the political context and then go to electricity. I hope I have enough time. Um, so um, you know that in Israel, or you might not know that in Israel, the, the political situation is very, very delicate. So Israel is a state which is uh, combined of 80% Jews and 20% uh, Arabs, which most of them are Muslims. Uh, the, the, the background for the creation of the state of Israel was the withdrawal of the British from uh, Palestine and uh, creating the state of Israel after a war between Israelis or the Jews, they were not Israelis yet, and the Arabs uh, living on the same, on the same, in the same country. We also have, uh, uh, and because of that, the whole context of who is allowed to live here, what are the basic uh, legal <laughs> needs, uh, or uh, uh, to, to say that a, a house is legal, or uh, a settlement is legal, it's political. It's not just um, legal. And in the Negev, we have a large group of people. They are called Bedouins. These people live in uh, unrecognized villages in terrible poverty. They used to be uh, um, nomads in the past, but they settled now in very different rural communities. They're not connected to water. They're not connected to electricity. So when we come and say that the connection to water is a human right or uh, accessible water is a human right, it has a political context. And the state is cautious about recognizing these rights. When you talk about electricity, it's the same because their, their settlements are not, not acknowledged as legal. They don't have infrastructures. So what's the next step? We have to connect them to water. So we did have a few cases about that as well. If we have time, if it's interesting, I will talk to about a little bit about it. Um, but they found a solution there just in, in short, they uh, have like containers of, they don't have running waters in their houses. Okay, they have containers in the villages, they go by foot, sometimes long, long distances, they get, they collect water and uh, they pay for it as well. 
Um, so the issue of infrastructures, water and electricity in Israel is very political. Um, I want to talk a little bit about electricity. After the huge success with water disconnections, we said, okay, what's the next step? We are talking now about disconnections of electricity uh, in a modern country, in a um, digital or um, Western country like Israel. Everything works on electricity. You, all the housing systems, all the education systems, Everything works on electricity. If you don't electric, if you don't have electricity, if you don't have access to electricity, then you cannot uh, access many of the basic functions in everyday life. But how did it all start? It all started when we were called to visit a person's house. This person, which I will never forget in my life, was a very sick person. He he had cancer uh, in very advanced stages. He could hardly breathe. He was uh, using an electric uh, mobile uh, electric um, mobile chair, and uh, he was at the risk of being disconnected from electricity. He used to use oxygen. He just if he didn't have electricity, he would die. And we said, I sat there with my colleagues, which is also she is a lawyer from a different organization. And I have to say, this changed my life. This meeting changed the course of my career in a way because we started the struggle from there to make sure that no person in Israel will have will live without the basic electricity needed for survival and to living in dignity, which is two different things. Survival and dignity is not the same. So um, the first step as always was to connect to people from the ground. And we found some amazing partners, social workers, and, and we started to, to understand, to learn the problem because uh, when we went to meet, it, to meet the authority of electricity, they said, what are you talking? You're not going to do to us what you did in the water field. We will not provide electricity for free. Who will pay for it? You will pay for it. I will pay for it. Who do you think will pay for it? So the beginning was very uh, deterring. Um, on 2017, we went first to the Supreme Court of Justice. And again, with an administrative claim which turned to be a two uh, double-edged sword, if you say so, if you, that's the right way to say it, uh, because uh, we won this appeal. Again, we said there are no regulations, it's not substantial, it's very technical, you have to have proper regulations. So what happened? We won this case. There are regulations, but they are terrible. They actually didn't change much for people living on, you know, living in everyday life, it stayed the same. The interest is a bit lower. You have people population. Some are protected from disconnection. But in general, it didn't change anything. We found ourselves, again, uh, facing <laughs> the problem of we have to address this issue as a constitutional issue. So uh, what happens next is we start saying, oh, we have no chance. Nobody will. We have no chance. They will uh, throw us away out of court. We, will, we are asking for free electricity for people. The state of Israel is in a terrible condition. There is no way we, we will be able to, you know, to win this case as well. So um, we, we took a lot of courage. And again, we said we have nothing to lose because the situation as it is, is, is not very good as well right now. And we applied again with a constitutional appeal saying very good electricity or access to electricity is a human right and you have to protect it and to provide it to every person living in Israel. You don't want to give a carte blanche for people to consume as much as electricity as they want. Okay, you have to define what is the minimum and you have to supply it and you have to separate collecting the debt Okay. Um, please, please carry on. Okay, so so this was a we went to court, you know, shaking nervously. What are the chances? What kind of nerve do we have? And then we had Corona, the outbreak of Corona the financial situation deteriorated terribly in Israel. Um, the electricity company, after we appealed, 
decided they, they don't, do not disconnect people during the corona. So the situation now is not, you know, severe. We don't have any more people calling us and say, I live without electricity, uh, help me, save me, whatever. Now it seems okay. So we went to court. We had a first discussion um, about two months ago. And amazingly enough, it was so good. I mean, the judges were prepared. They read our appeal. They read the stories of the people which we, uh, uh, which we uh, wrote in the appeal. And uh, they asked the state, how can you justify your policy? Now, what happens is they we have an order NISI, or it's a show cause order, as they call it. And we're waiting for the state response. And we're very hopeful about this case. Uh, I think even if they don't get all of our demands, if they get part of it, we already changed the world for many people. And uh, I'm really, really proud of that procedure. I wanna show you um, something that has to do with the... Um, uh, uh, no public work that we do through advocacy and, uh, um, and the Facebook mostly, the web. Uh, can we show them the YouTube? Uh, so if I can speak on top of that, because I want to translate it. This is something that we uh, uh, published on the Facebook and it had a huge number, hundreds of thousands of uh, sharings. Huh? Masked, just give me a second. Oh, maybe I can share it. Yeah, yeah. My... you can absolutely share it. We have uh, enabled the screen share, the screen sharing uh, options. So you can share it directly as well. Okay, let's see if I can do it. Just a second. Share screen, how do I do it? I don't know how to do it. Ah, oh, there it is. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes, Can you see it now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So I will translate it because it's in Hebrew. This is, a, a, as I said, um, a, little, a little very short film which we, uh, um, which we did on Facebook and had, had a huge success, was in all the news, uh, news uh, diaries, all the news, all, over, all, all television networks. At that moment, thousands of women, men, and children are living without electricity because, because they can't afford it. How long would you stay without electricity? Electricity is not luxury. Electricity is a human right. That's it. So um, just a few words for you know, uh, summing up what we said today. Uh, we're still waiting for the decision of the court. We're waiting for the state's uh, response. Caroline, get oh, yeah, yeah, just a second. Skin booster. Sidrat Seumi Motsmatiim Beriku. Um, 
We do have other uh, cases which we also try to tackle the issue of existence in human, human poverty through the, the, the you know, actually uh, the same claim. You cannot ban a person from accessing a very vital service because he can't afford it. So we have the issue of ambulances. You have to uh, uh, give them ambulance services if they're in need, even if they have a debt to the ambulance services. Uh, national security, that's something that we're starting last next week. Um, protection for, uh, uh, for housing for people indebted. Uh, today, you, are, you can just sell a person's apartment if uh, when you have this, this there is a, a legal system that does that. But we did insert into the legislation, a very, very important uh, protection uh, to the um, to houses. And as I said, everything is around the main goal. What does it mean to live in human dignity in Israel? Of course, this is a question also, which is, uh, which is local, which is cultural. Uh, as you said, as, as, I, as you saw in, in this, in this uh, movie, you know, this is something in everyday life in Israel. Maybe it's not something that is relevant to other countries or all countries. So it has to be very focused. Also the definition of human existence in human dignity. Um, I want to say to say for you know to sum everything up, there are a few principles regarding protection of uh, of social rights and access to vital services, especially at the age of privatization. First of all, the main the main uh, principle is that it doesn't matter who provides the service; the state has an obligation to protect accessibility. And not only in regulation, it has to be done in the highest form of norm in legislation. If you can do it in a constitutional law, it's great, but we don't have it, that in Israel. So we, all the we are all the time insisting that every privatization, every change in who supplies the services will be done in legislation, not in regulations, not in uh, different orders, the, the, the highest of norms. It has to be accessible, not only financially, but geographically, procedurally. Due process is a huge issue for people living in poverty, uh, linguistically and culturally, because this is a, Israel is a state of, uh, uh, in which you have a lot of uh, people migrating from different states, also the Jews. Then these are very important, very important principles. Bureaucracy and human rights. Sometimes a good start is to insist on due process something very technical, so-called technical, but sometimes this is the key to protect uh, human right, a human right. Uh, when you talk about how do you uh, provide accessibility of the most vulnerable to that, uh, to that right, the procedure is super important. It has to be transparent. There has to be a straight regulation. There has to be information. Supervision should be done also by the parliament and not only by the state. For the, state, the ministries, is the ministries is very very easy, and uh, you know it's much more easy that someone else provide the service. No, but the, the the elected members of the parliament they should do the supervision, like um, and I think this is something which is a, a tool that we use a lot. But as I said, it's dangerous. Sometimes you get what you want, but the situation doesn't change at all. When we talk about uh, uh, privatization, you have to ask: Is it needed? Is it going to improve the service, not for the state, but for the beneficiaries, for the people? Is it going to give them a better service? Many times the answer is no, it's not. So is there a justification for privatization? Also, as I said, regulation and pricing always will be de determined by the state. And you have to maintain an ability of nationalizing a service. For instance, in Israel, you have all the welfare services uh, the community welfare services are privatized. You have uh, different uh, organizations which are great and have great intentions and they do the service for the state. Are they, uh, is the um, procedural law applicable on them or are they private? It's a legal question which we tackle all the time. What happens if they go bankrupt? It happened, it happened. Can the state take over? And I can tell you that in Israel, in one case, the answer was no. It just one of the uh, organizations that covered the whole of the north of Israel uh, went, you know, just collapsed during one of the wars, and people left without any kind of any kind of service 
for a long period of time because the state couldn't do it anymore. They don't know how to do it anymore. They don't have the infrastructure. Um, one very important uh, um, thing that when, when it comes to privatization, the public uh, law, the procedural law should be applic applicable on the private uh, uh, providers as well. They are providing a, uh, a service for the state. They are an organ of the state. And this is something which is very important because when it comes to for transparency, they don't need to give you any, uh, information. Who are you? They are a private body. They don't, uh, they don't owe you anything. Should they uh, give people due process when they decide things about people? It's a question. Of course, for me, the answer is yes, but it's an ongoing struggle. This has to do with regulation. When from scratch, when you already start to privatize a service, when you think about it, you have to already uh, take that in mind. Uh, um, another rule is that, as I said, any service which is something that you need to pay for, the collection of the debt is completely separate from providing the service if it's a vital service and it's different in every state and every country what is vital and what is not. The example I gave of water and electricity is exactly uh, demonstrates this claim. And one of the, the, the things that we said is that you don't have to give a full service, but you have to let partial accessibility to a vital service that as long as it maintains the right to uh, living in human dignity. And any kind of consideration or um, uh, this decision whether a person is entitled to something or not will never be done by a private body, always by the state. And this is an ongoing struggle because the state always wants, you know, to privatize everything. They don't want, they even privatize the, 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 the inspection, the regulation. We had uh, fields in which th this was done. No, this is still your obligation. You need to supervise. You cannot privatize the supervision. And when it comes to entitlement, who determines the entitlement? It's always the state, not a private body. So I'm pretty much done. And I wanna, in, for the, I wanna write, read a poem, which uh, pretty much sounds, uh, I think it's very emotional for me. The poet is called Roni Somek. And I think uh, you will identify with that. So um, there it is. Sorry, my kids are at home. Uh, we're, st we're still not back to school, maybe tomorrow. It's called Poverty Line and it is by Roni Somek. As if you could stretch a line and say below it, poverty. Here is the bread made black with cheap makeup and the olives in a small plate on a tablecloth. In the air, doves flew with a soaring salute to the ringing bell held by the kerosene vendor in his red cart. And there was also the sound of rubber boots landing in the muddy ground. I was a little boy in a house that was called a shade in a neighborhood they called a transit camp. The only line I saw was the horizon and under it, everything looked like poverty. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nasket. I think we had a very, very enlightening, uh, I think, lecture because we also go through similar issues. We are constantly fighting for basic human rights in India as well. So it was a good learning experience, I think, for all of us to see that there are similar situations, similar issues being uh, dealt with in other countries. Uh, so I would just want to know if there are any questions. So there are a couple of questions that have come. Uh, Masket, so there are some of the questions have come on the chat. So one is from Lara. I think she's from Liberty. So she's asking if, uh, is there any text? on this case, which is available, because uh, I think a lot of us would like to read it and to understand the issue more deeply. So if yes, if you could please share it with all of us. Um, there is text in Hebrew, but if it is interesting, we can make it translated. And uh, yes, it would be my honor. Um, there is just one little thing which I forgot to say, 
I mentioned it in very short, uh, when we wrote the first appeal regarding electricity disconnection, we, we used a um, uh, judgment of an Indian court. Um, maybe you know it. Um, the name, the name of this judgment, it was done by the High Court of Judi Judi Judicator at Madras. And um, what it said is it was regarding uh, a group of people living without uh, electricity, a very, very, um, an, an amazing decision. I, I think you might know it. I think it was called Prakash. Uh, and um, as I said, these judgments, which we found by chance, I wish we could have something more um, structured from which we can draw from your experience and we can share our experience because we, this was a, like a moving judgment, said everything that we believed in, but we encountered it by chance, you know, by Dr. Google, um, that's it. I think we've had shared experiences on that end because there are different cases before the High Courts and Supreme Court, especially cons cases regarding constitutional challenge to laws at times. In my personal experience also, I have seen that we have actually taken a lot from uh, judgments of foreign courts, uh, from especially from Canada, in my case, I think in my personal experience, and it felt like everything we needed was just there in a judgment. And that was the best way to, I think, put forward how courts in different countries have, you know, looked at a certain issue. I will uh, quickly move on to the next question. Uh, so we have another uh, person who has asked that it's interesting to see how a private player is representing, you know, is providing services for the state. So how does that play out in... Uh, Can you repeat the question? I couldn't hear. So in your context, we saw that a private player is providing a service on behalf of the state, right? Something that may not the question, the, the understanding would be how would you understand it in the context of India, for example, that a private player is providing services for the state. And as you explained during the lecture that when during one of the wars, when one of these corporates completely crashed, the state did not know how to provide yeah. basic, something as basic as electricity or water. So how do you, I think, uh, address this issue? Um, I think that uh, when we work on issues of privatization, as I said, some fields, uh, some some fields of action of the state of Israel are completely privatized. I mean, it's already too late. For instance, welfare, and it's I think it's not by chance that they are all they they usually start where the most vulnerable population is. It's easy to privatize services there because these people have no voice, no electorate. Uh, if they have complaints and they're not heard that that um, that that loud, and um, what we're trying to do now, now we we have a new something something new that we want to work on uh, here in Acre, which is uh, in relation to digitation and artificial intelligence. We see that happening more and more in the state of Israel, and it's very alarming because where they want to implement it first on welfare allowances. Uh, so one of the claims, one of the things that we're saying, no, you don't do that pilot here. Do it in, I don't know, taxation of the, the rich, the ultra rich on the third apartment, for instance. But you cannot start the pilot when it comes to the most vulnerable population. So we're trying to, you know, to catch up with this process because it is so quick. And uh, the state is very slow in addressing those issues of responsibility, of uh, transparency, of due process, or even what is the le legal background to the to the action of these these bodies, these privatized bodies? I think that uh, it's, in a way, in some cases, it improved the service, but it has to be done very very carefully, and you have to make the people who are the beneficiaries, you have to make them a part of the process. They have to be heard. They have to participate. This is a basic. Uh, principle when it comes to privatization, when it comes to every service which is changed or rethink about, and of course, you, us as 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 um, as, uh, as lawyers, we are thinking about the legal context. What happens? We are always thinking what happens if something goes wrong. So I was, for instance, I was involved in the legislation of uh, foster care, new legislation. 
And one of the things that we say there, you cannot just, they wanted the state to begin with, wanted to have one provider for the whole of Israel. And we said, no, it will not be less than five. Because if one collapses, what happens to the other? And we gave this, this example, it happened, it already happened. So today we have five providers. It was under, uh, after a huge struggle. But I think they also understood the logic. It's easier for them, you know, to, to control one provider. But it's not, it's, not, it's not logical to do it this way. Thank you so much. I think we'll just maybe take, do one more question. So uh, we have a question that asks, uh, how does the judiciary and the legislature work? Like what is, I think, the relationship? What is the dynamics, really? Between the legislator and the judiciary? Judiciary. Yeah, we, we have a, a separation between these two powers or authorities, and that's why there is such a huge criticism uh, regarding the Supreme Court of Justice, because it is, as I say, by the conservatives, it is considered very progressive, and uh, they, they, they blame this court for taking over the state. You were not elected. You are not represented. You know, in our in our um, legal system, uh, the, the the judges are appointed by a body which consists of lawyers and judges and some politicians. They are not elected like in the states, for instance. Um, so they are often blamed to be too progressive, to be uh, too advanced, to take over, to 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 change the you know against the will of the people that elected the parliament they overrule uh, they can overrule legislation by the parliament and if i can uh, relate to what's going on during the corona times what we faced is a huge number of legislation that was actually uh, risking all civil liberties uh, in the name of uh, fighting the epidemic the right to movement the right to self expression the right to um, to freedom of speech the right to protest and uh, we and we had like legislation which enabled the, the secret services of Israel follow people and monitor where where they are, as if to fight the epidemic. And um, so we do see we do see the court as actually the last frontier when it comes to stopping this initiative because the Knesset is becoming more and more, um, I would say, more uh, nationalist. Unfortunately. Uh, very conservative. It's really hard to convince. So when we have, we always prefer to convince, but we, when we cannot do it, we go to court. And sometimes we have no, no other option but to go to court. And we succeeded in these appeals. We had a huge success in, you know, um, not stopping, but, you know, putting some obstacles in the way of the, of the governance. Uh, but it, we're, we're, on the other hand, we're very much afraid that uh, the balance between uh, parliament and court is so fragile. And you see also legislation that trying to uh, limit the power of the court all the time, all the time. And we have to be there in the front to be against it. But it didn't happen, you know, it happens little by little, like for appointing the judges, for instance, there is a change in the, in the composition of the judges. They are becoming more and more conservative, but, Okay, that's a part of who rules the country and they decide who to, to, to appoint. But they want to change the legislation to have a legislation that says that the court cannot overrule a certain legislation by the Knesset. So there is no scrutiny. And this is very problematic because this is a first, uh, not first, a major step, you know, in risking the democracy. Thank you so much. We have just, this is the last question, I think. That is, uh, are there, I think, uh, areas in Israel where there is no telephone connectivity or any kind of, I think, mobile connectivity? And are you also looking at taking up this as an aspect of human rights or as a basic necessity? Um, first of all, Israel is a very small country. I mean, if you look at the map, you might, uh, you might find it funny. It makes a lot of noise, but it's very small. Uh, no, we don't have areas who don't have telephone connections. On the other hand, we do have uh, the issue of uh, radiation from uh, these devices and antennas. And if we talk about environment and human rights, this is also an issue. Where do you put these antennas? Who suffers from these antennas? How do you get uh, energy 
And the whole issue of sustainability and energy and poverty is something that we are also involved in. Um, but, uh, and I think, of course, one of the things that we said when we talked about the basic right to electricity is when we start, we say, we don't want to tell you what the components of the right are, but we can suggest, and communication is one of them. You have to have today, you use mobile phone to do many, to, 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 to access many services, many governmental services. You have to be able to charge your telephone. You have to have a telephone at home. You have to have internet. You have to have a computer. You know, we are not in schools for almost years. My children are almost a year at home. What do we do if we don't have a computer or an or a internet? We have 150,000. It sounds like funny, I think, in, you know, in Indian you know, proportions. But in Israel, it's a lot. Uh, families who don't have uh, internet at home, what happens with their children? Do they get education? Everything is done by Zoom today. They don't. So uh, the access to services of communication and energy is an issue, definitely. I did see a question here on the chat regarding uh, Bedouins. Did I answer that question? Uh, whether decisions have led to Bedouin villages getting piped water, electricity? No, no. Uh, as I said, the solution, what, what the, the thing is that um, the decision and every legal, in every legal aspect, these services are provided regard only if the connection is legal. The connection is legal if the house is legal. If the state does not consider these houses legal, it does not provide services. Sewage, water, electricity, these people don't have these services because the state does not want to give them these services, not because it can it cannot, it can. It wants them to move from their villages into uh, towns and villages which the state created, terrible places, nobody wants to live there. So it's a political issue. And the political issue is the question who owns the ground and electricity and water and infrastructure are just the tool to control, to, to, gain, to gain this uh, you know, advance, advancement in this, uh, in this conflict. We have a lot of work still ahead of us. I think that is each of us in our countries. Basket, I would like to really, really thank you for the lecture. And I think each of us have learned a lot and I think have realized that we have shared experiences in each of our countries. And uh, this has been a very, very enlightening uh, experience for each of us, I believe. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. And I think we will uh, close today's session. And for all, everyone else who joined us and who stayed with us, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we will have the next lecture will be scheduled uh, on the 12th. And we will share all the details uh, shortly with you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank it's been an honor. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you.